Okay. The question is, will man rob God regarding our giving? Now, I bring this up because it was brought up to me that uh, there, there's a question about how is giving? How are people giving? Uh, the answer from my perspective is I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so let me say some things about that at the, at the start. Um, you know, I don't know what anybody here gives or, or doesn't give or whatever. I don't know what anybody here makes. Um, and I, I don't know what anybody here has. So uh, don't think that I am somehow aware or watching the flow uh, the amounts uh, that are coming in or, or, or uh, you know, some inkling of, of what you are or are not doing. I do not. I have no idea. All right. And I don't want to know. I don't care. Um, but that being said, let's look at this together, you know, objectively. That's the point. Point being, this is not anything that's intended to be personal or some kind of an affront or an attack. But it is what the scriptures teach. So let's look at it together in that way. Uh, yeah, I don't know, but God knows what you give and God knows what you make and God knows what you have. And he knows more than that, too. I mean, those are metrics that I could figure out, I guess, or the FBI or somebody could figure that out. But God knows more than that. He knows what you could do, <laughs> what is possible, what what. What opportunities are there that you're not taking or availing yourself of? So you got to think about that um, and be concerned about what God thinks in the matter. Well, the title of the lesson, Will Man Rob God, is coming from Malachi chapter 3. And uh, we we'll go there and look at this. Here we have a late prophet speaking to those who have come back from Babylon and speaking with them about their giving and how they are giving and what's happening there um, in the land. When he says in Malachi 3, verses 8 through 12, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how? Well, you're robbing me in your tithes and contributions. Now, that's an interesting thing. He's saying you can give, you can tithe and contribute, um, and yet be robbing him. How is that possible? <laughs> and uh, in, the, um, in the Septuagint anyway, they took this as the swindling, like, uh, like Jacob, you know, taking the heel of his brother and swindling him out of his uh, inheritance, like you're swindling God somehow, um, trying to, you know, maybe use an accounting trick or something, I don't know. But whatever it is, they're giving, they're contributing, but they're still robbing God. So that means something specific, which is there is a right amount. <laughs> There's a right amount to give. That's what that means. You can be giving and yet robbing from God at the same time. It's not like you start at zero and anything positive is just fine. You know, give whatever you can. Like, no, this is God who gave you everything you have and are. He should get paid first. I know the aphorism is pay yourself first, right? But no, pay God first and then pay yourself <laughs> or whatever. I'm not even sure what that means. But pay God first. I know that. You are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. So the tithe is about the tenth that they were instructed to give of all of their produce in the land. They're supposed to give a tenth of everything they make. Why? Because the priests eat it. Why? Because the priests don't have land and they don't have agriculture. and They're not growing food. So they need the contributions. They eat the contributions of the children of Israel. Why do you need priests? Well, because you need someone to teach the law and to intervene, to, to mediate on your behalf in terms of sacrifices and other things. So they're not bringing the full tithe, the full tenth into the storehouse. There isn't food in the house. The, the priests are not able to eat. Their families are struggling. The teaching is, is uh, 
suffering because of this, right? That's, it's all the typical deleterious consequences. Thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. It's interesting that God says, put me to the test in this way. <laughs> there have been a lot of tests that we put God to, right? But the one that he actually asks for is this. Give like you should and see if your need doesn't go away. That's what he's saying. Put me to the test by this. See if I won't open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. Your vine in the field will not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. At that time, all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. When we say the devourer that God rebukes, he says, I rebuke the devourer. It will not destroy the fruits of your soil. The devourer is a, you know, a locust or a mildew, a blight, something that destroys crops. Those are things that are, you know, somewhat out of our control. Things happen. But he said, I'll rebuke it. Your vine will not fail to bear. If you give God first, if you give to God first, he will bless you. And, you know, Jesus said the same thing, right? Seek first his kingdom and all these things will be added to you. You have what you need. Then will all nations call you blessed. And then are you a land of delight? So there's, they'll have what they need in addition to having done what is right in terms of priority, that they put the teaching of God's word, the sacrifices, the service of the tabernacle first. And that's what they should do. When they do this, then they get what they need. But Haggai records some of the things that you're thinking about with Malachi. How did this come to be? What exactly is happening? Well, Haggai is a priest in the time, or I'm sorry, a prophet in the time when they have come back from Babylon and it's time to rebuild. Rebuild Jerusalem, but they're not doing it. In Haggai 1, it is recorded, verses 2 through 6, thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. <laughs> it's interesting. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the time has not yet come. No. No, that's not it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say the time has not yet come. <laughs> As in, the Lord didn't say that. The people said that. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Well, is there something wrong with a paneled house? No, there's something wrong with living in a paneled house while this house lies in ruins. We cannot, you know, take care of ourselves first. We have to take care of God first and God's things first. Give to the Lord, do the work of the Lord first, and these things will be added. Uh, what is a paneled house? I don't, you know, I think he's talking about the fact that they have, you know, wood. They have, you know, hard structures as opposed to just tents or temporary structures. Or perhaps these panels are decorative somehow, uh, beautiful, whatever it may be. The point is they're extra they're superfluous. It's not really required the way that the work of God is required. That the emphasis is on the house of the Lord should be built. Now, the thing about this is that, you know, we're here in the paneled houses, you know, we've come out of a faraway land. We've come to this place. There's no walls yet because we're not done with that. Um, 
and there's no temple yet, but we do have houses to live in. And, you know, as long as we're here, we might as well make them look nice. You know, it's like the pandemic, right? <laughs> Home Depot is so thankful for the pandemic. <laughs> as long as we're here, we might as well make it look nice. Uh, um, right, this is the thinking. And yet, is it really the time for you to be comfortable and God to suffer? To suffer loss? Is that how it should be? Yeah, not really, right? The time for us to be comforted is when our work is done. This is the time to serve the Lord. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of armies, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. Yeah, that, He's saying, you know, look what's happening. Why is it happening this way? Consider again what Malachi said. Put me to the test. Bring the full tithe and see if I don't open the windows of heaven for you. There will be no more need. Here, they sow much but harvest little. They eat but not enough. They drink but are never filled. Clothe themselves but not warm enough. It's all of it not enough, not enough. Why? Consider your ways. But the reason why, you know, as he says here, he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. It's leaking. <laughs> the bag with holes. Well, what's that? I mean, you kind of know what a bag with holes, you know, and you put your wages in there and they fall out, right? But it's leaky. What we mean by this is there's a cut, you know, there's a percentage, there's a, a, a you know, grift happening. It's being lost. The, the money is, is not going to God. It's going somewhere else. And it's doing so like as if your money bag had holes in it and you kept using it. It's doing so as a rule, as a habit. We, we've gotten into this idea that, well, we, we're earning something, we, we, and, and it, first it goes down this hole, and, and it goes to these things. And that's just not right. First it goes to God, and then take care of everything else. Then in the seventh verse, he picks up again down to 11. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. This consider your ways, he said earlier, with you're working, you're making the effort, but it's not good enough. Why? Think about that. Now he says, consider your ways. What ways? Well, they're sitting there saying the time has not yet come to build God's house, but they live in built houses. <laughs> so they have built houses, they have paneled homes, but there's no temple to worship God. That's not important, apparently. It's not time yet. Time's not right. Well, the time's never right, if you think about it. He who regards the wind will never sow. It's never right. Consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build a house. Why is he saying that? Because their thinking is, well, we don't have it. We barely have enough to eat, to whatever. You know, do you want us to tear down our houses to, to build yours? No. Go to the hills and bring wood. What is that? That's, you know, <laughs> initiative, problem solving. Whose will are you trying to do? Are you trying to be stopped from doing what God wants? Are you trying to let nothing stop you from doing what God wants? That's the point. Uh, there's always reasons why not, or this won't work, or this will never happen. Yeah, uh, th that always exists. I heard a financial um, advice person say, I get about 10, you can't do that here. That's not legal. 
that won't work in this code. He said, I get about 10 of those for every, will you show me how to do that? <laughs> I think he was telling the truth about that. I don't trust him about much else, but I think he was telling the truth about that. It's true. We're really good at finding ways why that's not going to work. But somebody needs to say, you know, I want to get this done. What is God's will? What is God's way? Well, let's do it that way. You know, here they sit with no, with no walls, worried about being invaded, saying, uh, you know, it's not time to build God's house. And they're surrounded by wood. <laughs> well, go get some wood and bring it back and build. That I may take pleasure in it. Shouldn't God have pleasure? That I may be glorified. Shouldn't God be glorified? You looked for much. Behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. That's why the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. At least very plain. I think Malachi was plain enough, but this is quite plain. Yes, you, you made some stuff. You, you came home and I destroyed it precisely because my house lies in ruins. The condition of my house is that it lies in ruins, but you're busy in your own house, your own business, your own things that you are doing that seem important to you, your pursuits. But God's should come first, and they're not coming first. And so he's reminding them that they need him by letting them suffer need. Because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is why the heavens above you have withheld the dew, the earth withheld its produce, and I've called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, on the new wine, the oil, what the ground brings forth, man and beast and all their labors. So it's coming. It's about to get a lot worse, he says. These things have been happening. They're there to remind you. The prophet speaks, and now I have called for a drought. It's about to get a lot worse if they don't start doing what they should have been doing from the start. Well, the start of this is verse 1 in the second year of Darius King, six month on the first day of that month, second year, six month, first day. So let's say June 1st. Word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Two, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, high priest. So you have Zerubbabel, you have Joshua, the king, if you will, or the governor in this case, and the priest received the word of the Lord by the hand of Haggai the prophet in year two, month six, first day. Then you go down to the 14th where it says the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, high priest. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of all the remnant of the people. God is stirring up the spirit of their leadership, of their priesthood, and of the people themselves. They're all working together in this. There are three. They have their different offices, but they are working together. The remnant, we lose sight of what remnant means. We think of remnant as a small fraction. No, 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 no. Remnant is the thing that has been rent. <laughs> remnant is the torn pieces, the tattered pieces that are left when the lion is done eating, for example. So this is to say Assyria and Babylon have destroyed them, and bits and pieces remain, and that's who's here, the people. Very small number, true, but Satan wanders about as a ravenous, roaring lion. So the word of the Lord came in month six, day one. They came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, 
on the 24th day of the month in the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. What is that? It's three and a half weeks. <laughs> yeah, so it's a time times and half a time. Right? A week, weeks and half a week. It's three and a half weeks. The word of God came saying to them, is this how it should be? And they had to think about it. But inside of the month, they got together and came and started to work on that house. That's how this went. Well, think about it this way with me. A better covenant is what we have in the New Testament. I, you know, yeah, it's my opinion, I guess I will say, but my observation uh, of what I have seen done in the churches is people speak about tithing um, as, you know, that's the old law, that's the Old Testament. They gave a tenth of everything, that's true. And uh, they were required to do so. Their records were public. Uh, you know, the the temple knew, if you will, the the official administration of the temple knew what the people had and what they could give and what they were expected to give. And if they didn't do that, they came knocking. All that kind of stuff. I get it. And that is the old law. But what I what I hear very often in the teaching is that. Well, that is the Old Testament, and the Old Testament isn't binding anymore. Jesus is the one. And, th and then everybody breathes this collective sigh of relief. <laughs> you know, like, whew, okay, good. I was afraid that I was going to have to give 10%. <laughs> I will go back to my very small amount of money and uh, not worry about it. But that's not right. <laughs> Uh, the way it should go is more like this. Uh, in the letter, the Hebrew letter in chapter 7, you read a bunch of things about how the covenant in Christ Jesus is a better covenant than the covenant of Moses. Melchizedek, we are told, is king of Salem and priest of Most, God, uh, Most High God. And Melchizedek met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. The greater blesses the inferior, of course. So Melchizedek is greater than Abraham and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything, meaning Abraham paid a tithe. He gave one tenth of the spoils of war to Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of most high God. Then, in the fourth through the sixth verses, we continue the commentary, see how great this man was, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. Hmm, how great is he? That's the point. Melchizedek, why? Well, because he's not Abraham. He's not descended from Abraham. He's greater than Abraham. Abraham paid tithes to him. And you think of Abraham as the patriarch, you know, the end all be all. He's the father of faith. He's our father. And this is all true. But even Abraham was not the end all be all. He paid tithes to Melchizedek. And Jesus is a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people that is from their brothers, even though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them and received tithes, or rather, does not have descent from them, this man received tithes from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Do you think Abraham was way better because he had the promises of God, that he'd be the father of many nations, right? All this stuff. And yet, Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek. One might even say, verse 9, that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. 
It means in a typological way. And, and, and the, it, it, it's following a pattern that looks like this. Abraham paid tithes. Well, Levi is collecting tithes, but he's collecting it from his brothers. You may recall that the priests themselves have to give a tenth, and their tenth gets burned on the altar. That goes to God. Well, the nation gives their tenth, if you will, through Abraham to Melchizedek, the eternal priesthood. Even Levi, who receives tithes, pays tithes, uh, pays tithes. This is to say the priesthood of Jesus, the kingship monarchy of Jesus is greater by definition. Maybe by a power of 10, you might say. But it's greater by definition. He is far above. In Hebrews 7, at verse 18, we continue the comparison. On the one hand, when we speak about the covenant of Moses, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law of Moses made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So the former commandment was set aside. It had a certain weakness and a certain uselessness because it couldn't perfect anything. The law of Moses could not bring anything to finish. It was a teacher. It was instructive. It was a pattern, but it didn't finish anything. Jesus is the finish. He's the end. A better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. On the one hand, the law didn't accomplish anything Jesus did. On the other hand, Jesus also brings a better hope. We draw near to God through this. Whereas those who worshiped in the former temple could not really get their sins forgiven. It was remembered year after year, offering after offering. We have a better hope. We have a better king. We have a better priest who outranks. We have a better hope. We have a law that is useful and perfects. And we have a priest, a priesthood, a kingship, Hebrews 7, 20 and 21, made with an oath. It wasn't made without an oath either. Those who formerly became priests under Levi were made priests without an oath. But this one, this Jesus, was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. But Jesus is a far greater priest. He has a better hope that he is promising his sacrifice can perfect. He has an oath from God that establishes him, which was not present before. All these things in the 22nd verse of Hebrews 7 make Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. We have a better covenant, a better agreement with God. Continuing the thought, we go to the 23rd verse. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. And that's pesky, isn't it? I hate when that happens. But he holds his priesthood permanently, Jesus does, because he continues forever. So it took a whole army of priests to do what Jesus is doing, because he lives forever. They were mortal, like you and I. Hebrews 8, verse 6 tells us, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better than the old. So the service that God does and the serv or I'm sorry the service that Christ does and our service to him is better than the old. It's as much better as the covenant is better. Since it is enacted on better promises. As we said before there's a better hope. There is a perfection meaning a completion, a maturity that comes in Christ that was not available under the law of Moses. And in Hebrews 9, we read verse 22, 23, 24. 
Yes, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things, meaning the earthly tent and tabernacle, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, the things that you read about in the law of Moses. But the heavenly things themselves, it has to be the case that they are sanctified, as he said, purified, not with these kinds of earthly rites, the blood of bull and goat, bulls and goats. The heavenly things must have been purified with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things. Christ has entered rather into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So he's not in a temple somewhere as a proxy to God in the heaven. He is in heaven. He speaks with God face to face. That's our mediator. The purification of the sacrifice under Melchizedek is that Jesus gave himself. He is the offering. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Well, how much greater does it get than that? That's the thing. Why are we talking about this? Well, because, uh, you know, as we said, or, or as I mentioned earlier, what I too often I'm seeing is people talk about, well, the tithing, it's Old Testament, and the Old Testament is done away with us, not bound anymore. And yeah, I know, I get it, that's true. But it wasn't just dropped. <laughs> it wasn't just loosened. They were told you shall, you know, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus said, Love your enemies. Do good to those who misuse you. Right? They were told, you shall not murder. But Jesus says, anybody who's angry is liable to judgment. Right? They were told, you shall not commit adultery. But Jesus said, whoever looks at somebody to lust for them has already committed adultery in the heart. Are these looser or tighter regulations? Are they weaker or stronger? Are they lesser or greater? Are they better or worse? And then when we look in Hebrews and we see we have a better covenant on better promises with a better mediator, with the heavenly things, not the earthly things, how then do we draw the conclusion that we do less? I don't see it. I can't argue that from the scriptures. How do we draw the conclusion that we do less? I don't know. It's not in there. I don't see it. If this is better, shouldn't we be doing better? Shouldn't we do more? Or at least do what they did. I would think so. As I said before, I don't know what you give and I don't want to know what you give. I want to teach what the Bible says. And there's plenty, there's plenty here in the scripture that bears witness to us that what we have yeah, the old is gone and is done away with and was earthly in its provisions, but it was replaced by something better. It was fulfilled by something better, something higher, something much more valuable. I don't have any way of concluding that that means we do less. We give less. I don't see it. And in 1 Corinthians 16, we close out, put something aside, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put aside something and store it up as he may prosper, that there will be no collecting when I come. All right, well, we know that in this particular case, he's talking about taking uh, from the treasury at Corinth support for needy saints in Judea. So what he's saying is, I'm on my way to Corinth. When I get there, I would like to take what is available from the treasury, not show up and then everybody say, hey, I'd like to help. And we go around, you know, with our hands out soliciting. No, it needs to be the case that the church supports this. All right, fine. However, 
the pattern persists. The first day of the week, right? Every week we consider, have you prospered? As he may prosper. Means you're setting aside and storing up as you prosper. Meaning, when you make more, God makes more. It also means when you make less, God makes less. This is okay. What we would call this is a percentage, uh, a cut, a portion. Decide what cut does God get of your income, and when you get it, you give him his cut before you do anything else. He always gets his cut. His cut is first. That's all this is saying. You put aside something, you store that up, as you prosper, that's how this is done. When you make more money, God makes more money because he gets a cut, a percentage, a portion, right? But it's also true that when you don't have as much, well, you don't give as much either, but it's the same proportion of what you have. That's how it is. If you make $100, you give $10 if you're going with 10. You make $20 with well, then you give two. Well, you're still giving the same amount from God's perspective because you're giving his percentage, his cut. But that's how this works. But, you know, it's also true. You make $10,000, well, you give $2,000 or uh, uh, $1,000, right? If, if we're going with a 10% idea, right? You make $10,000, you give God $1,000. And you do that first. The rest is yours. That's God's. Because, well, he gave it to us. He made the world. He made the produce in the world. He made the increase in the world. He made the sun from which we get all of our energy. Right? He gave us our lives, our opportunities, our bodies to labor with. Yeah, it makes sense. He deserves the first cut. But 1 Corinthians 16 is just saying this is a percentage. You, you said a percentage. And what I'm getting at from this from the scriptures is, uh, you know, on, uh, on in Hebrews is we have a better covenant. I think you ought to think about that pretty seriously. Does it mean that we give less or does it mean that we give more or does it mean that we continue to give, but we do so thankfully? We don't necessarily have a, a Levite tribe or something like that, but we do have other things that need to be supported. But when you go back and, and think about the prophets, and what they had said, you know, all these things apply. Like, shouldn't God be important? Shouldn't God's service be important? Do you think to yourself, well, I can't afford to give to God this much? Well, what do you mean? Why not? <laughs> God should come first. And as he said, put me to the test. See if I don't provide what you need. Now, this is not a prosperity gospel. We're not saying, you know, you give too much, put yourself in the poorhouse, and God's going to pull you out of there. Now, there's no promise that you're going to get a return on investment or anything like that. We're saying when you give what is right, God will make sure that you have what you need. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom, and all these will be added to you. you got to trust what Jesus said. you got to trust what the scriptures show. This is the pattern. And the alternative is not very good. When people don't give a tenth and you have somebody laboring there who's trying to make a living by doing that laboring, it takes a lot more than 10 families for that person to do so. That's the other side. Are you looking at the, at the um, logistics of this? If you're a congregation and you want to have an evangelist, uh, and, and you want to, that person to, to be compensated in such a way that he can live and work among us like everybody else does. Well, the percentage that people give, you know, determines how realistic that is. If, the, you know, if there's 10 families and everybody gives 10%, well, then he has the equivalent of the average income of the congregation, and that seems very reasonable. That seems fine. Right? You got 20 families, 30 families, 50 families, whatever it is. You get to a place where you have the ability to support an evangelist, um, to support your elders, to support your, your widows. 
right? There are many things that can be done, but if you think about it, you know, people giving a lot less than 10% was well, going to take a lot more than 10 families just to have somebody preaching the gospel. That's the other side of it. And, you know, ancient Israel, I get it, was a physical implementation. And, you know, I, I mean, you know, I know that <laughs> as well as anybody does. <laughs> I'm the guy that's crazy, remember? <laughs> You're not crazy. I'm crazy. I'm the guy that uses the Old Testament all the time. <laughs> and people are like, oh, well, it doesn't mean that. Yeah, okay, but oh, I'm very well aware that it was a physical implementation. It, it, it's one big metaphor <laughs> for a spiritual thing. I get that. I understand. But it still is what it is, and that lesson is still there. You can see what happened when they didn't bring the tithe. Their priests suffered. They didn't get taught like they should have been taught. They didn't mature like they should have matured. And their other things began to suffer as well as God spoke through the prophets earlier. That they couldn't get their, you know, their, their um, produce didn't work out. Their labor didn't pay off. Their money bags didn't hold because they didn't put God first. Well, that's just to say what Malachi said, will a man rob God? That you're robbing me in tithes and offerings. You gotta think through these things for yourself. I don't know and I don't wanna know what you're doing. I'm saying this is what the Bible teaches. God knows and God wants to know and is going to judge. So you will give answer for it. Don't feel uncomfortable around me. I have no idea and I don't care. It's none of my business. And God doesn't need what we're giving. God is not the one who is in need. We need to give to him. So that's the, got nothing to do with it. There's no you know, personal aspect to these things. What I'm saying is, look at what the Bible shows. Look at the patterns that we see there. Consider the comparisons that we see and realize that we're not all that different from them. We have the same kinds of struggles and the same kinds of thoughts and need the same kinds of reminders to put the Lord first. And that's one of the ways in which we do so. So that's, that is the lesson there. I appreciate your kind attention. Today, if you are not a Christian, a child of God, we want to help you to obey the gospel of Jesus before it is too late. Indeed, God has given us everything that we have and are, all of our life and our breath, our food, our ability to work, our opportunity to work, all the things of life, our blessings that God has given us richly to enjoy and to use for his purpose. If you have not obeyed the gospel, you're not returning thanksgiving as you could and as you should. Obey Jesus for forgiveness of sins. Be baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins based on your repentant heart coming to him and trusting faith. Today, are you a Christian who has not lived right? Let us pray for you that you may be restored to him. The prophets spoke to the people of old, and, and they speak to us too when we read these words and we think about them. So take these things to heart. Think about what the Lord wants, and let's see. Let's put God to the test and see what happens. When we do his will first, we give to him first. Let's see what happens. Today, if you need our prayers, we're glad to pray with you. If you need to be baptized, we're glad to help you. Let the need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.